good. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for our, our talk series. We've got a full house tonight. It's like half the writers in New York are joining us. Very good. And so, uh, so tonight we're going to get into your story. You know, we've had, we've had a lot of folks from all different uh, countries, from all different uh, generations join us on this art talk. Usually it's, it's Carlos Mayer doing it. Uh, every now and then I come in. And so I'm, I'm happy to be hosting tonight. And for everybody that uh, doesn't know, we do these art talks quite frequently and we do it to connect each other as a community. We're, we're scattered around the world. We're all doing our own thing, but the writing movement is a very big community. And this is a way for us to get together. This is a way for us to share each other's stories and learn uh, about this movement and learn about each of these artists sort of uh, career, their trajectory, their contributions to this movement. And without further ado, we have Sade, so thank you so much. And just a little bit about, about Sade. So Sade, uh, for those of you guys that don't know, is a lifelong artist going back to the early 1980s uh, in the South Bronx when he used to paint walls and trains in his neighborhood and in his area and around New York City. Uh, after that, he sort of grew into having his own business and he ran a successful uh, art business for over 16 years. And then since then, he sort of ended up reinventing himself in the early 2000s and going on to pursue uh, a degree and a career in the design arts. And so all along the way, art, art, art seems to be the thread. Uh, and what's so fortunate for all of us that have known Sade or have seen his work is that he started to paint again. Uh, and sort of in the past 10 years has come back out with a vengeance and painting a lot in New York City. And so we're happy to have seen that and happy to sort of be able to experience it if we, um, like myself, might have missed those early trains and that early sort of activity in the 80s when things are so pivotal and, and so fresh uh, for, for us living in New York. And so we're going to just jump right into it, Sade, and get into, into your story, which is, I would say, a, a Bronx story. And so can you just start off by sort of explaining to us when you first encountered writing and the notion of writing, how was that for you? And, and when was that, if you can recall? Okay, so, um, well, first and foremost, I wanna say thank you to the museum. Thank you to you for the invite, Mayor. And, uh, you know, what's up to everybody out there? Thanks for checking in, you know, and spending this little time with us. Um, so, to your question, when did I encounter writing? I encountered writing in 1978 in junior high school in the seventh grade with Rush and PC. Okay, and, and when you first encountered it, what, what did that mean? You just, it, this is the first person you met, he was tagging in the school or, or what? So literally I was, I was uh, we used to play in the yard. I went to Clark Junior High School in the Southeast Bronx, Elijah D. Clark, uh, across from the Patterson Projects over by 143rd Street on that side of the Bronx near Third Avenue. And um, we would stay in the schoolyard to play baseball afterwards and sometimes football. And I stayed late one day, and then I was leaving, walking to the 42 bus. And as I got to the end of the building, because Clark was a very long school, very long building, narrow, long building, um, I saw Rush standing on the steps, um, taking a tag on the, on the, you know, on the, on the doors. And I was like, wow, you know, what's up with that? Yo, let me get a tag, right? Because I had heard about it, kind of, sort of, or whatever. Yo, let me write my name. And, you know, he was like, oh, here. And he just gave me this marker. And, like, I never saw a marker that big. Like, I had no idea what was going on. I don't even remember what I wrote, but I just did what he did. You know what I mean? It's what, it was one of those things. And then from there, it just sparked the interest. And he was like my go-to source in the very, very beginning because he's the only person that I knew that did graffiti. So that, that's pretty early on in seventh grade. That's what? You were like 12 years old or something like that? Yeah, I was, yeah, I was 12. I was 12. And so, and so was it common in your school and in the neighborhood at the time? Like, were you... Did you see it around enough for it like to be so uh, sort of instinctual to even want to do it? Well, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I can't say at that time that I knew that I wanted to do it. It was just like I discovered it like Christopher Columbus discovered America. Right. It's like, yeah, he discovered it. I, I saw it for the first time right there and then. And I thought it was the biggest thing in the world. But this thing had been going on, which I would learn later on. It had been going on for a long time. And so many people had been involved 
and all kinds of things. So it, it was kind of sort of like, it was all over the neighborhood. It was, you know, if you got on the bus, you would see the buses were, were tagged up. If you got on the, on the trains, you saw the, the graffiti was on the trains. You know, the hallways was like, like that was, I was the king of my hallways, like in 79, you know, like that's the only sure. thing I got up. Sure. So it was everywhere. It was just, it seemed completely normal. It seemed like, okay, this is something to do. I still, I still at that point didn't understand what it really was. And when did you go from not really understanding when it re what it really was to sort of knowing, okay, this is what it is and this is something that I want to do? Um, my sister had bought me the book Getting Up. Because at the time, so I, I got going with it and I was really like, you know, being that juvenile delinquent kid you know, and showing up at my house with spray paint and these things and, you know, writing in the hallways. And I got in trouble for writing in the hallways in my building. And so my parents were aware and they say, oh, you need to channel your, you know, you need to channel this in a different way, is what they were saying to me. So they were getting me books to draw in, which would later I would later know that they're black books, but at, at that time it was just a book to draw in. Um, you know, and it kind of sort of, it, it went that way, that as, as they were trying to get me to channel it and take it somewhere else, you know, I realized that it was this thing. And then when my sister got me getting up and I looked at that book and I read the book from cover to cover at least, I don't know, three, four times, all of a sudden like the light bulb went off. Like it was like this thing. It still was really foreign and it was fantastic. You know, and I was just like, wow. You know, it, it, still, it still didn't hit me that what I was doing was gonna lead me to what I was reading in that book. You know, I didn't think that was achievable for me. It's quite a fantastic book to be introduced to at a very young age, with especially with the stories of of Lee painting trains. Yeah. It's like a, an adventure book, so to speak. And so you discover this book, you know, and, and I'm curious about your family because you mentioned that they sort of encouraged you by giving you uh, drawing books. Can you, you know, what, where's your family originally from? Like how, how long were they in the Bronx? And, you know, it sounds like you had a pretty, pretty good family that was supportive. Well, I mean, you know, I think my family story is probably similar to, to a lot of family stories in that my mother and my father got divorced when I was very, very young. Um, my mother lived in Manhattan on 96th street. Um, but my father lived in a project in the Bronx on uh, McKinley projects between 161st and 163rd and Titton Avenue. Um, and I, I don't know, if, <laughs> I don't know if, if they were trying to encourage it. They were just trying to get me to stop from doing it on the walls in the building. I understand. I mean, it, it, I think that they must have been not only concerned about that, maybe about your safety, or maybe they, you know, they, they were thinking that it might be something illegal. But, you know, at the time, if you think about the, the late 1970s in the, in the Bronx, it, it was considered the poorest district in America, like the number no, one poorest district in America with also the highest unemployment rate in America. And so do you remember knowing that or feeling that like in the Bronx or were you because you were a child oblivious to sort of the conditions in the Bronx? Yeah, I, I would say I, I was I was oblivious to the politics. I wasn't old enough to, to have that that uh, real interest in politics to know the dynamics of the condition that we were in. But I, I did know that, that, you know, I can tell the difference between my mother's neighborhood, which is 93rd and 3rd Avenue. And my mother was a business owner. She was, you know, she did very well for herself. You know, she lived in a very nice place. So I could tell the difference between being there and then being in my neighborhood. You know, I, I knew that there was a, a huge difference. I understand. And so you went from you know, writing your name in the hallway, being the king of your hallway, your your family trying to channel your interest maybe more constructively, so to speak, into maybe drawing. Did you decide to go that route? When did you decide to say, okay, maybe I should be drawing. Maybe I should, you know, become more artistic leaning. Was that immediate for you? I don't, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know. I never thought about it. I, it was just, you know, I mean, you know, it was a, it was a normal thing to me, like the, the progression of how I got into it. So in a really short span of time, I started meeting different people, right? So I knew Rush and Rush was connected to NPC. So there's Slip and Colt, you know, and Cap and those guys. And then, you know, from there I met 
a guy named Michael Ramos who lived in John Adam, John Adam Projects. And through him, I met Nicer and I met Zimat. And I met, you know, and it was kind of like this thing of meeting all these different people and finding out like, oh shit, everybody's doing this. These are all, you know, I, like, like I've seen the names on the walls, but at that point, other than Rush, I had only seen his name on the train. And I didn't really see it until like maybe 79 was it where I really saw his name on the train enough to be like, oh wow, he's, you know, he's doing something. Um, I wasn't doing anything on the train in 79, but he was. Um, but, you know, it was just one of those things. I, I, I never thought about the, the path of the process. I kind of just fell into it. Got it. It was sort of uh, maybe like more of a coming of age thing, just like you might have decided to learn how to play basketball. You just did yeah. it. It was, it was organic. You know, it, it, it was of the time. It was of the place, you know. Um, across the street from me, I had Revan and B, B-E-A and Revan, R-E-V-E-N. Um, and I met them and I went to paint, a, I remember I went to paint a gate on 174th Street, like in, oh my goodness, uh, I forget, maybe 1980. And that was before I ever painted on a train, you know? So it was like, you know, I had to like do those baby steps, you know, of, of learning how to use the paint and all this stuff. And like that whole process just became a daily activity. It wasn't like, I didn't feel like it was anything that was different than other people, like you said. Some guys choose basketball, some guys choose this, some guys, some guys choose that, I chose that. So, so where then did the name Sade come into play? Sade. So like that wasn't my first writing name. So the first writing name I picked it myself and I played around with a bunch of names. My, my first name is kind of corny, but people will remember that were into basketball, maybe Chino if he's listening. Um, so the, the New York Knicks had a player that his name was Gando, G-A-N-D-O. And every single time he drove to the basket and he made, and, you know, he scored, the, the sportscaster would yell, Gando, you know, like had this, this real rhythmic way of, of yelling out his name. And I just caught my, my you know, just caught my ear. And then I, I went with that first name. Then the second name um, was Kang, K-A-N. Okay. And then I, wrote, I, wrote, I ran with that, you know, and that's when I met um, G-Man and, you know, and the PGA guys and TR guys and stuff like that. Um, and then Sade came about from, so I was into MCing. I think that a lot of writers from, from, my, from my area, from my era, and still some today, you know, we kind of did all these different things that were relative to what we were doing. So it, like, they call it hip hop today, but you know, everybody DJed, everybody MCed, everybody wrote, everybody, you know, kind of, you know, all you did two or three of those elements. And I MCed, so my, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican. I'm a Puerto Rican descent. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. And, um, so I'm the darkest one in my family. And, and as a kid, they gave me a nickname, say Jorge Negrete, which is uh, George, Black George. Is, if you translate it directly to English, it's Black George. So they made fun of my skin color. I kind of took that and turned that into my name on the street that became Shade, right? So, cause I, I, like the, I, you know, I like the word Shade. And then I put Ski at the end of it because at, the, at that time, you know, in the early days of hip hop, people were putting the, that suffix at the end of, the, of their names, S-K-I, Ski. A lot of people sure. So the name was Shade Ski. So then I was, when I was going to um, high school, I started high school in 1980 um, in Brooklyn. And every single morning I used to ride the train with um, G Ski TR, uh, Pre Suite, Bo 174, and a kid named Diamond that used to do jackets from 174th. Used to live in a uh, Tape Masters building, 174th. And um, so I would ride the train with them and, you know, hang out. It's funny that I rode the train with, with Pre Suite probably maybe six months without knowing who he was. He never said who he was, even though I, I was talking about graffiti and all these things with G-Ski. But anyway, I showed G-Ski some outlines one day, you know, showing him some stuff. And he's like, dude, like, yo, that H is horrible. You need, okay. to, you need to drop that out of there, right? So, and I did that. I actually literally just did S-A-D-E, right? And then that's that name that came about. Subsequently, just real quick, let me get this in. I found out that I wasn't the first one to write Sade. I want to make sure I put that out there. So it's not, I'm, you know, historically just respecting the history. I was not the, the original Sade. The original Sade was a guy um, called Sade Five. And Sade Five was actually his alias. He used to write So One, TGA. And he's, he was partners with um, LK, TLP, Lil Corrado on the Sixes. Um, so, you know, shout out to Sade Five if he's listening. So, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that's, that's amazing or, or really interesting that you're saying is talking about PGA, talking about TR and these, these 
teenagers or these young men that you're going to school with um, and this being something that's associated with hip hop, so to speak, right? Because those guys, uh, including G-Man, were known for doing block parties. Yes. You know, and DJing and all that stuff. And so you got into, into the mix with a pretty good crew at the time. And, you know, I'd like to know if you could share a little bit more about those uh, writers and that crew in particular, because we've never had them on. And it's sort of a special piece of Bronx history that I don't think too many people know about. Well, um, well, pre Sweet passed away. Pretty pre. And, uh, you know, for the people that there's a lot of writers on here today, so they know that he was like, the crazy street bomber and he just bombed everywhere he went he had a mark in his pocket he took a tag anywhere he went at all times didn't matter where when how and he, no matter how fly he was no matter what he had on he would get up um you know g-ski is actually un p if you know um the new rappers of today un p is a is a rapper he's a he's on k slay show a lot um that's that's uh g-ski's son he has i forget his other son's name he's a rapper too but um you know g-ski he was doing a little something something he didn't get crazy but g-man Gordon, um, I spent a lot of time with, with, with G-Man. I, I, I literally, every single day, I would go everywhere with this guy. You know, he was on crutches at the time, which was really amazing to me because um, subsequently, later on in life, I would learn what it, what it is to be disabled as a result of an accident that I recovered from. But um, I ran around with him, and, and there wasn't nothing that he couldn't do on those crutches. So I ran around with him for a long time. I ran around with BS-119 a little bit, but not, not for a long time, you know, kind of met him. And as a little young kid, I got on his jock, right? That's what we used to say, you know, he's jocking him. So I was jocking him because he was up. And, um, you know, that, that kind of didn't go that far. I didn't really do much with him. But two of the, two of the guys that I first went to the trains with, you know, we're talking trains, is Coast, TDS, and Beal, TDS. Those two guys. Okay. Okay. And, and, uh, and those are old writers. I think here you see, you know, an image where you see B.O. Insides. Yeah, yeah. Just so people can kind of understand who these people are. You know, I think, you know, one of the things that's a challenge sometimes when we have these conversations um, is that we don't have photo references to these times. You know, back then, you know, being a, a teenager, you know, you might have just been living it without necessarily thinking about taking photos of everything, taking photos of the, those times on the train with uh, G-Ski or pre suite yeah. And so every now and then we come across some images that sort of, you know, take us back to those times. And coincidentally, I pulled up an image uh, and you can see B.O. in here, uh, yeah. insides. And then, you know, even for yourself, uh, there's images of, you know, people like Bantu and your own insides in, in this image. Yo, we caught, the, we caught those trains first. I'll tell you right now. I'll never forget, the Sixers first went white. I mean, when they first went white, they didn't go clean on the insides. But when they went clean on the insides, um, you know, a lot of people weren't touching them. So they were clean as can be. And I remember that, that, that particular tag, I started writing really tall. Right? At first, I didn't write my name that way. But then I started writing really tall to take up the space. And um, we, would go, we started at 138th Street. And we would just work our way up the tunnel. So we go 138th, you know, to, to Brook, Brook to Cypress, Cypress, you know, just keep hitting every layup all the way up to, to Longwood. Um, and Band 2 was ahead of us. He was in there that day. You know, we, he, was, he must have been far enough ahead of us that we couldn't hear the doors opening and closing. But every single time we came into the car, you know, you see the drips. You see that he was in the car. And the crazy thing was is that it was me, Tro, uh, Hire. He's a, you know, Tro was my partner and Hire was a six line rider before me. And we're working our way through. We're taking maybe one, two tags in every car. Bantu's taking seven, eight tags in every single car. He's catching the headliner on the front. He's catching the headliner on the other side, facing the front. He catches the headliners over the windows. He catches the end panel. He'll do the big deli tag or the big Bantu tag stacked on top of each other in every single train. We couldn't keep up with the guy. Amazing. Right. And well, he was known as the king of the insides. He was, he was prolific. Yeah, he was a machine. He was a machine, and, and not just on the six line. Oh, no, on the fours. On the fours, like, he put the only smash on those fours, you know, like, for a long time. Him and a guy, another guy, um, Duel. 
the original yeah. duel, not maybe the duel that you know, but the duel that I knew from from the from the forest. But then a lot sure. of other, a lot of other guys, right? Because I didn't I didn't ride ride the forest a lot. Sure. And so, uh, so what what did it mean for you as a young rider to be doing insides? Like, you know, what was the allure of of doing that? I mean, when I was taking tags, I still was just following the lead. I, I don't I don't think I I didn't have a plan. You know, I, I just I didn't I didn't really have a plan yet. You know, per se, like it was. I love to tell you a fantastic story about how I planned this and I had this mission or whatever. But I mean, Coast and Bo were like, you know, they were into it, right? Like they took me racking, like, you know, some of the first racks I ever went to, they took me to, you know, and, and I kind of learned racking from them and from G-Man, who was like the shoplifter extraordinaire of the century. Like I've never seen anyone who can actually um, walk out of a store with anything he wants as quickly and as easily and as swiftly as he does it. Sometimes in, play, in plain sight, like his sleight of hand was crazy. Like he didn't have to necessarily hide in, in a spot sometimes, he would just do it by just turning while, while he's on his crutches really quick. Next thing you know, the thing is gone. But there wasn't a plan to it. You know, it was, it was kind of just, um, it just, it just sort of, yo, we're going bombing. Okay, cool, I'm coming. You know, because I still was trying to figure out, you know, like I still, in my mind, was just trying to figure it out. It, that's really basically the truth. You know, I, I still, okay. didn't, I didn't know what was really going on. All right, so then, so then where did you go from that to figuring it out? Like what was, what unlocked or what changed that you said, okay, now I got this, I figured it out. 19, How did that come about? That was 1981 to 82, right? I was, uh, I went to, um, so by then I had met a lot of different writers, you know, and, and, you know, I was in high school. So when I went to high school, that opened up my, so I grew up in the Southeast Bronx, right? And, and basically my jurisdiction was between Manhattan, the upper Manhattan and the Bronx, like anything that was north, I used to think that the world ended at 241st Street. And then I used to think that the world ended at 86th Street because I never ventured much further than those two places. And I would go east to west, but not much further than that. So when I went to high school in Brooklyn, that's when I met um, Chief TM5. So I was, um, I was in the 10th grade. He was, a, he was a, I think he was a junior. Maybe he might've been a senior at the time. He was a really quiet dude. He didn't really talk to nobody, but he used to wear these dope, jackets and the pants so i knew he was a writer um and then i met um, <coughs> a pale who was really good friends with um Seth from brooklyn you know with the double style tags and um i met cam so i met all these brooklyn writers dips you know re didn't come till later re didn't come to until i was in uh i was a senior i think i was a senior what? junior when re came into the school um but that opened up my my brain to it being more than a local thing because they're telling me these stories about this whole other world and they're taking me to you know on train rides we're going to you know Hoy Skimmerhorn we're going over to you know it's like you know we would go to where the Grand Street layup is at not go in but they would say look this is the Grand Street layup you know what I mean I'm like oh wow there's the layup trains over here you know the first time I went to Utica I went with dips so it opened up my brain right and once that opened up my brain that just that was like 81 then that just it, it just clicked right there because I did it. I did my very first piece on the train in 81. I did it. And I remember it like yesterday. I wish I had the picture. Um, it was on a dirty car. It was, um, it was a beige, beige interior, cherry red outline, um, baby blue um, flame around the outside with regal blue outline on the flame, white highlights, school bus yellow, um, you know, dots inside the, inside the piece. And so I was at the bench the next day. Um, and this thing rolls in. So the bench was 104 next Street in Grand Concourse. And this thing rolls in, and it just happened to be on the second to last car on the south, you know, on the, on the southbound side. So if it's on the southbound side, it's almost right directly in front of the bench. It's just over one car. But it stopped, and it was there. And it was like, uh, you know, a bunch of riders was there. Um, and then they saw it. And, you know, I remember Agent, Agent grabbed me, Agent TNT. Agent grabbed me and roughed me up like, no just grabbed me, roughed me up. It's like, yo, I see you, you know? And then it's like, all of a sudden, like, I think it was part of the acceptance that I received that moment that clicked it for me, right? Because then I be became addicted to seeking that acceptance. Got it. You suddenly were part of the club. Yeah, in a lot right? of ways, yeah. Right, you were validated. Yeah, yeah, you I mean, know? I guess you could say that. I mean, in my world, you would have thought that I hit lotto. It's a, it's a good thing. It's a good thing, luckily, that, that you got that acceptance that day. Otherwise, you might not have continued. Maybe, maybe. And so, you know, once, once you did that first piece 
and you realize, okay, this is this you're you're in, right? You're in. You've you know you've been recognized by agent, you know other writers. When did you go from that to saying, okay, now I want to have style, and I want to do it with style? So, so the style thing, the style thing was just. Once I did a piece, I started looking at a lot of pieces. So there's a few pieces that I can still remember in my mind that hit me. Some of them may have not been fa that fantastic. Some of them were that hit me and caught me. And I think that in the beginning, I don't, I don't know it was as much of saying I wanted to have style as much as it was of saying I want my piece to look like that. Okay. I, I still didn't recognize style for, for what we know it to be today. And so, and so who were, who were some of those writers that had that feeling that you're talking about? So when I used to stay at my mother's house, I used to walk, uh, my mother was on 93rd and 3rd, and I used to walk to the 6th train on 96th Street. And I had to cut through a schoolyard because I was coming from 3rd Avenue to Lexington. So you cut the diagonally, you cut through the schoolyard, and Sharp used to have a top to bottom, Sharp, um, <coughs> K.A., King's Arrive, yeah. you know, yep. Delta's partner. He had this tall blockbuster, style, not blockbuster, but a tall top to bottom style piece that was on that wall that I used to walk by all the time and I would always stop and look at it and then I thought it was like the greatest thing I ever saw in my life you know like I was like oh I want to do that I want to be able to do that you know and I went home and I, I tried to draw that you know I tried to draw my name like that you know he had the S he had the A you know I, I took yeah. that I took the P and I converted it into an E you know like I did those things that we do um the Lee piece going into the um the tunnel uh at, at Third Avenue when the five and two train goes it underground at, at third avenue just before the third avenue station between jackson avenue and third avenue lee had a piece on that on that box for a long time that just you, you know was you know like to me i used to ride the train go up and down just so that i can see it from the front of the train coming in you could get it clear you know see it over and over and over and it was just a lee piece right it was a blockbuster or whatever but it had a certain impact to me a visual impact and i wanted to do that you know um crash used to have um these gates on uh, on uh, Brook Avenue, up and down Brook Avenue. He did a few gates, him and Dates. You know, two guys that were in my early recognition in my mind um, of, of, you know, piecing. And I used to go over there and just stare at the gates, you know, and just look at these gates and, and then go home and try to, I guess, emulate what I was feeling from seeing that because I couldn't memorize it, right? But I tried to get it as close as possible, hoping that I can do that still not knowing that it was style but you know eventually you know you see what happened so so yeah i think a lot of the pieces that you're describing are pieces that were sort of plain styles or maybe block styles or, or simple styles yeah right right and so there's something i guess about maybe the the legibility of these kind of styles that make them accessible to not just you, but to all of us. And so when you look at a piece like this, this Dandi piece, which right. is, you know, just uh, a, a magnificent piece, it, its legibility really matters, you know? And so I could understand that you were attracted to the sharp block letter, to those Lees, because Lees, they were, they were perfect. They were impeccable pieces. Um, and so when you started doing, you know, trains as well, it seemed like you started to gravitate towards those styles that were, were readable. So, yeah, I, yeah, that's exact, that was exactly it, right? And I was around, so I don't have a hand style. I don't consider my hand to have a, a dope hand style, right? It was never, even though I bombed and I wrote on the insides, I don't consider myself to have had a, a dope hand style. But look who I ran around with in the very beginning, Tro, Coase, and Beal. All three of them wrote almost like a very legible, you know, take up the space, make it impactful. You knew what it said. You know, there was, yes. no, there was no mistaking what it was. You know what I mean? They would take up a lot of space with, with the tags, you know, on the insides doing that. So I kind of was seeing that. And it wasn't until I started riding the six train that I started looking at the, like the Zephyr tag, right? Cause that's like, you know, it's an iconic can style. And I, and I used to just look at the Zephyr tag and make my best attempts to write my name that way. But, you know, I just failed miserably. Just, I never, I never caught that. Sure, sure, and but and by the time you, I mean, you were also mentioned Pre Sweet, who also had a very legible, yeah, right, signature but a, style. He a, but he had a flow to it, right? Because he leaned his, he learned, like he leaned it to the left, you know, kind of like the way scene TC Five used to lean his 
you know, that's that's like scheme, scene, they all had that real, you know, yes. noticeable lean to you know to the to the left. Right, yes. which, which is weird, right? Because scheme is left-handed, right? So to him, leaning his piece to the left is is unusual, right? I guess, but he did. He leaned it that way, and and pre-sweet did that too. He had the big loop over the top of the P to make the P, and then the R. It almost was script. And sometimes, if you looked at some of his tags, it, it was script. He didn't stop. He didn't. He didn't stop when he was with a spray can. He would just go non-stop and just write the name out. The T would stand by itself, but the E's would be connected. The W would be connected. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah. let, let's talk. Let's talk a little bit about about you finally making it to the outside of the trains, and and doing these pieces. And you know, you're you're sharing with us a lot of this work. I want to make sure we can get through through it because yeah. I'm not sure that everybody has seen this work. You know, I'm not exactly. familiar with all of it, but there's a lot of great pieces here. Um, and a, maybe we can start with this right one. That's eighty three. Eighty three. So this is 83, and this is a, a, a white train. Right. So the sixes, the sixes, when the sixes first went white, and, you know, it, I guess there was a weird thing happening, right? It wasn't, I don't, you know, some people say, oh, people were scared to hit them because of this, that, and the third. Even though the Vandal Squad was heavy on the six, you know, thanks to scene and all of them. <laughs> um, at first, when they went white, nobody was really touching them. They kind of was just standing there, right? And then we started hitting them doing throw-ups, you know, and I, and I'm, I was never known for bombing with throw-ups, but I was doing throw-ups, SE throw-ups on the outside with um with price marking ink, markers, because the markers were quiet, so we wouldn't be making noise in the tunnel because you know the Vandal Squad was heavy in the line. So then, every you see in a lot in a lot of my pictures, the early pictures, you'll notice that the train is perfectly white. I I didn't carry white spray paint to clean the train. We were catching them just like that. It was they were like pieces of paper. It was it was like I didn't know any better, but when I've talked to old Older writers, they say, man, you guys are so lucky. You guys were painting on pieces of paper. Sure. You didn't have to worry about anything underneath it. No. And so here we go again, on another white train. Yeah. So so just before you flip to this one, from the other one, just wanted to say, if you notice that, like, for instance, to this day, like, Bio and Sess and some people, they call me Sadie. So in the beginning, I was writing Sadie. So once I found out about the, the Sadie 5, I put the Y on the end. Got it. So that became, it became it. Sadie. And so there's blockbusters that I did Sadie blockbusters and stuff like that. But yeah. But anyway. And and so and so painting on these white trains, how long would these pieces last? Not long. Not long at all. So the trains would get painted white all over again. Yeah, the sixes. The sixes that in eighty three. In eighty three, you hit a six, eighty three, eighty four, you know, um, you know, an active train that was moving around, it was it was gone. It was gone in, in you know, in a week, two weeks be gone so very short period of time unfortunately i had better luck with i had better luck with the five and twos with pieces running for a long time so here here again is is another very nice looking white train with a great piece on it thank you same same year or same I'm guessing this is also on the sixes yeah that's on the six no that actually that's on the um i think that's on the two i think that was on the two that's um that's uh 1984 Got it. And so here you're painting with uh, with a writer named Dune. Dune. So yeah, that's that's. So if you've seen older cars, and you've seen Krypton pieces, that's Dune. Got it. So let's let's share that with with uh, with folks because you do you, we do have pictures of some of these uh, cars that you're talking about. Here's a Sadie and Krypton. Right. That's one of my favorite cars because. That was a party that night. Um, we painted that inside the station at 143rd Street on the sixth line. Wow. And, it, and we painted from the southbound side. So 143rd, if you ever came out into the street, it's where the old Lincoln Hospital used to be before they moved it to Third Avenue. And in 83, it was desolate. It was just factories. There was nothing there. So after 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, there wasn't even a token booth. There weren't even token booth clerks at that station. So it was empty. And we would come down the hatch. Uh, in front of R. N. S. Strauss, which was a block away from Dune's house, and we go down there, and literally we hang out, we go to the store, come back, all the guys. So T. C. M. is not a graffiti crew; it's a bunch of my friends. It's all, just all of us neighborhood kids, and like they would all come down there, and and then we have beer, and we we're playing radios, and we're just chilling out. We painted that right in the station. Incredible. So so something like this, how long did something like this take to paint? 
I don't really really remember how long that took, but I would say at least maybe five hours. Got it. So yeah, so you had the whole place to yourself. Yeah, yeah. Back then, I I wasn't. Yeah. So that, those are like the the very first pieces where I was now starting to. So I have pictures of all the first pieces. I have a few scattered ones, but that's when I started formulating size, right? Because it's not that easy to paint on the train when you first start out because you don't size it correctly. It doesn't sit right on the train, you know. You think it looks that way when you're doing it, but then when you see it running later on, you realize you either paint it too small or you paint it off center, you know, these things. Right, so the, you, you have to start to figure out how to design these things in advance so you have the, the most success, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. You just you just have to get used to painting on a big scale. That's all. And so, with with a piece like this, I mean, what, what what kind of planning went into doing this? Was there much planning, or was it more improvised or freestyled? No, the outlines. Well, the, the outlines. You know, I drew the outlines, and then you know, like the rock thing was just, you know, again, all the inspirations of my time. Remember, I was on the six line. I had seen doing rocks all the time. You know, the mid-77 and scene car with the rocks, that, that, that train just kind of like was a, a tattoo in my brain, you know, for, for like, I want to do that right there. That's what I want to do. I want to achieve that eventually. So I guess this is my attempt in trying to get, go in that direction. Very cool. And so you move, you know, moving forward to, to painting these trains, I see the, the rock theme is back here again. Yeah. Or perhaps this is earlier. It, yes, earlier. Right. And so I, I can understand the impact of these those trains. And I think everybody knows what the, that Mitch train, Mitch scene train that you're talking about, because it was in subway art. Right. And well, it was a very just, iconic train. At the same time, for, 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 you know, from the practicing perspective, I understood just how good they were by looking at what I was doing. <laughs> right. Because I, I thought that it was so, so great. Right. And I had like all intents of like, I'm going to king the whole entire world with this piece that I'm going to do. And then when I was done with it, and then I see this right here, you know, which is at the same time as that car, you could see just how good and where they were at with what they were doing at that time in, in comparison to what I was doing. I was just like, wow, I had a long way to go. It takes, it takes time to get that good. Yep. And so here we have an, an earlier piece. Yep. Right. And so you can see yep. that you, I mean, you're developing and, and I'm guessing these, this is within a few years. So you're developing pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was just, I was just, yeah, because there's a Krypton tag on that car. So, yeah, that was before Doom. So, that's all. Everything, be, everything from, with, with a Krypton tag on it is before either 83 or there's a Fane tag on it before even Krypton is before 83. So, tell us about this one, which I think is a, a really great piece. Now, you're introducing characters as well. Yeah, so that's 85, right? So, yeah, yeah that's, that was 84, 85. I did that in the Harlem Tunnels in the wintertime. So, that was... Um, that was pretty good. I did two cars that they did a Bev's top to bottom and I did that the same day. Um, but by then I was starting to figure it out, right? So like you can see that I got the letters all sitting right on the ledge. You know, I got the, I got the, you know, it comes just to underneath the windows. You know, I got my, I got my splash. It looks symmetrical. It looks like it makes sense, right? I was just figuring out how to really put it on the train, you know, and make it look the way that I had it, had it in my mind, right? I had a little bit of control. Right. So you had you, 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 you by this point, you figured it out and you've been yes. also you just, you know, you're introducing cartoons in here. Yeah. As well. So I that, mean, was, that was I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a funny story. I, BG, if you're listening. So BG, BG had done a car in the bio. I think it was they'd done a car and BG had did a, a, a like it looked like a bug, you know, similar to the stomach on my bug or whatever. So he had did the bug and that I did that off the top of the head thinking about that character. Oh, that's funny. So I know the car that you're talking about. Sure. And so then you mentioned Bebs. This is, is yeah, this the one that you, this so is the Bebs, one? Yeah, Bebs. Yeah, Bebs is, um, that was Doom's little brother. You know, he was, um, he wasn't a writer. You know, he just took tags around when we, he was with us. He was, you know, but he was a thoroughbred. He was, a, you know, a street dude, real thorough, you know, about his, you know, about his business. He did what he did. Um, and he passed away. He had a, um, he passed a few years ago. So rest in peace to Bebs or whatever. But that car and that top to bottom, I did the same night. Okay. Here we go with uh, another one. Yeah, that was that was that car was actually crossed out. I was that car actually never ran clean. It actually came out came out of uh, I forgot where I did that car. I might have did that car in the Ghost, maybe. I'm not sure. But um, 
so you could see so i so i fixed the photographs myself right so i've, I've gone in there and i re airbrushed the car back to you know like make it look exactly like it looked the day it was painted um which takes a, a really long time so that's the comparison between the top and the bottom photo but the car came out crossed out and i was um pretty upset about that and and so so what was that about what what was happening at the time that was it just normal or was there a reason for it yeah i never i never i never had cross out beefs right i never got into that um i took it really personally you know maybe i took it a little too far you know because to me crossing crossing me out wasn't just like oh we're gonna start crossing each other out you crossing me out, you ain't never crossing me out again. You know, that was kind of like where my head was at at the time because that's how much these things meant to me, right? I used to think that that was the end all be all. There was nothing more important in life. And for you to destroy it was like destroying me. So I had to get back at you. Um, well, if you imagine, if you imagine, you know, you walk into a museum and, or a gallery and you destroy someone's painting, it's the same thing. It's, I guess, I guess. It's, yeah. a, it's right, it's, a, it's, an, it's an insult. The, yeah, theoretically it is, it was an insult, but it's a part of the game, right? It, it goes with the territory, especially once, once you start to get good or whatever, because they didn't put their name on it, right? So I, I never right. knew who, who crossed this one out. Got it. I wanna show, you, I wanna show this one here, um, simply because these are, these are names that people might not be familiar with. And you, before you mentioned how you were going to school in Brooklyn um, and encountering writers from Brooklyn, and here, th these are, names of of brooklyn writers can yeah. you can you just uh share share with us a little bit about these writers in this car so um so i painted that car um, i didn't paint the whole car um dune painted the Ariism, um and i did the dips so dips dipper mog and re mog you know who later on you know is known for partnering with by sr you know the, the like legendary you know war with RTW and all this craziness. Um, Dips was more laid back, more of a chill cat, real little, real little dude, but he had just he had crazy crazy guts and and he wasn't scared of nothing. Um, so because I was in high school with them or whatever, I was the senior. Um, I would paint cards for them and they would give me paint. What what school were you going to? I went to Brooklyn High School of Automotive Trades. Got it. She went to automotive. No wonder. Auto. Yeah. Over by uh, McCarran Park. McCarran yeah. Park. Across the street from McCarran Park. Yep. So, yeah. Yep. So, that, so that was that was one of a few. So it, very, it's very interesting cool. that, you're, you know, I'm glad that, that, you know, people have, you know, people that document the graph. And like you said earlier, like we had no foresight. I didn't have the foresight to take any pictures at all. And I didn't I've never taken a single photograph of any graffiti I did on the trains. Every, every photograph I have has been given to me. This, this photo was given to me by Chino BYI, like maybe, I don't know, I want to say like four or five years ago. That's incredible. That's very fortunate that all, all these works exist in, in photograph, especially on those white trains when they didn't last very long at all. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, for, for you know, you mentioned these artists, uh, RE and Dips and, and uh, you know, these, many of these artists, you know, or writers that you mentioned are no longer living. And so uh, rest in peace to, uh, to R-E-M-O-G, who uh, I also remember very much seeing him growing up, but uh, he's no longer with us. Yeah, he's a wild boy. <laughs> a lot of those Brooklyn guys were. Yeah. And so, and, you know, speaking of here, here's, here's a photo that's on the internet, which is, you can see R-E on the right as mm -hmm. well. Mm-hmm and some more of these Brooklyn guys that we're mentioning, PF and, uh, and Bust, more MOG guys. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the things that, that, you know, I've noticed in, you know, in the files that you shared with me are your sketches and how much planning seemed to go into your, your paintings. Yeah, so that sketch, that sketch right there is from, uh... It's either 84, I forget what year, probably Seth remembers because it was in his town. No, Rochelle may have been 84, may have been 85. But by then, I was planning it to that level where I would plan out, you know, the colors and I knew kind of in advance what colors I was going to do. Right. And then the execution is here for those yep. to see. 
you can't see you can't see that's the three color blend it's like the photo just doesn't you can't see it but it was a cascade green was in there you know um and so tell me a little bit about you you know you're you're gravitating towards these characters uh, that seem like they're like b-boy characters with these uh like you know big applejack hats <laughs> I always like characters from from day one. When I was um, when I was hanging out with uh, um, Snow, rest in peace, Snow and um, Miser and Plee, P L E, for a time. Um, at that time, too, that's when I met Jop and I met um, that's J O P Jop and uh, who else was in that little group of guys? Poem. That's when I met Poem. I knew Poem. I knew Poem from he was up. He was getting up before me, but I knew him from the very first time I started writing. Um, but anyway, uh, Jeff used to do really dope characters in his black book. And, he, and that's kind of like the first time that I ever had a black book in my hands and saw it and looked through it and saw that, this, that people did this. So I was attracted to the characters from then on. And then as time went on, you know, I saw books and I saw Scheme's characters and I saw, you know, Bee Gees characters and I saw Nice's characters and like, you know, the character just became that prerequisite element that you had to have in a, in a good piece, in my opinion. I understand. I mean, you see it there. You see it here. Yep. Clearly. That was, a, that was an homage to, to scene. To scene UA, not scene TC5. Um, because he did, the, he, did the, he did a car like that where he had the, the, the piece leaning like that. The blocks leaning like yeah. that. I just have different shaped blocks. But the idea was, you know, his idea. Got it, got it. And so, so let's let's fast forward a little bit. You know, I think we, you know, we we've we've seen, you know, a, a good variety of, of your work. Um, but you ended up, you know, taking a break, and then and then coming back, uh, and and painting with perhaps I would say, you know, some of the best writers in New York City. You know. Oh, yeah. um, and and not only painting with them, but battling them, and sort of calling them out to to a friendly battle, and uh, it, it's something very curious. And I'd, I'd like you to to explain to us, you know, what what that was, and and you know what what exactly did battling um, or does battling mean to you? Well. I mean, where I grew up at, battling is just a normal thing, right? Whether it was at Skelsies, whether it was at, you know, playing basketball, whether it was at MCing, whether it was at breakdancing, you know, you could see how big the breaking culture has gotten with battling, which is now they're talking about this whole Olympic crap, but which I think is going to change the whole game. Um, might not necessarily be a good thing, but anyway, um, so battling is normal, right? And so when I got back into graph. Uh, one of the good things of having taken a break so long is that when I came back to it, I still was stuck. You know, I came out of a coma, right? I was like Rumpelstiltskin. I still was stuck on that old frame of mind, right? I was kind of like completely oblivious to what had happened all those years because, you know, life took me in a whole different direction and took me to a whole different place where that it didn't exist. Plus, it wasn't of interest. So when I got back and started writing again or whatever, you know, the whole battling thing was, it was just a regular conversation. I remember being on the rooftop when uh, Cess was painting with, like, Serve, and they had this battle thing going on. They were talking about battling. I remember when, you know, painting, and I, I remember just being around Bio and, and Nice and them, and those guys talking about, and How and Nazem, and I'm talking about battling. Like, it was just that competition. And I love that. Right. I love, I love that, right? I've always, I'm a very competitive guy. I love competition, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I was, you know, I competitively, I boxed competitively for a while. You know, I played I played um, baseball competitively for a while to the Pony Leagues. So, you know, like, I like competition. And so graph, to me, is natural that it would be a, comp a competition, a perfect place to compete. So I started doing these things. And when I started, the whole, the whole thing of battling to make it like something official was I created a page on Facebook at the time. It was called The Art of the Battle. That's what it was. And um, the idea was that I was going to start battling these different guys, but to kick it off. The idea was to kick it off and see if it would gain momentum. But it didn't gain momentum. What happened was it became more like people took it personally as if I was calling everybody out, which was not the case, right? Um, I understand, sure. 
So I let so I let that so I let that go. But I I believe you know to answer the last part of your question, I believe battling is is super important at the at the basic essence of the of of piecing right like. It's great to go into a wall and do a super dope piece and stand back and take pictures and put it on Instagram and get 10,000 likes. But it's a whole nother thing to, to stand next to somebody who is really, really good and walk away from the wall knowing that they're looking at the piece and they're scratching their head saying, oh, shit, I didn't know he could get, that. He could, he could get down like that. I understand. So and, and so these the, this sort of mentality is, you know, is you know, I guess part of the competitive spirit that writers have always had. Oh, and so whether you're, whether you're doing it, battling with style or battling with perhaps quantity, right? Yep. Who, you know, you mentioned before that you were doing insides and you might have done two or three tags, but Bantu did eight, you know? Yep. And so he was, in a sense, you know, battling for supremacy of the line. There's, there's something really pure about battling, right? So you take, for instance... Um, one of my favorite battles, two of my favorite battles that I've ever seen that I thought were like real, you know, like real deal battles was um, Sesson Bio and Bio and Ticket. Because here you got, you know, these guys are like at the top of the food chain and what they do, and they're really good at what they do. There isn't much that they can't do, you know, and they put it out there to say, yo, we're really going to go at it. Like, it's really going down. Like, no, nah, we're not, this is not a kumbaya party over here. Like, I'm trying to like completely smoke you. You know, it was a real battle. It was it was a real deal, and it's something very pure about standing out there in the front line. I I know that a lot of guys don't want to battle, and I've noticed that. I've called out people to battle. You know, I'm not gonna name names tonight, but you know, you give me the talking, I will say what it is. But I've called people out to battle who claim to be style masters, this, that, and the third. You know, and yeah, 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 yeah. They give you the yeah, 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 but they don't want to battle because they can't take they can't take that that the purity of a battle. And it's gonna be out there in the open for everybody to see right there and then. Right. It's it's open for public judgment. It is. It's gonna be the truth. You'll you you will find out what the truth is. Like like Bai always says, the truth will set you free. It's it's uh, you know, it's it's a very interesting perspective, and I think that everybody bringing their A game is an exciting thing to witness. Right to to know that you have to. Sh it's like a prize fight, right? You're showing up. You know, you're showing up. You know, and, and hoping that you survive it so to speak, and to do your best and, and sort of, you know, uh, come out on top or victorious. Yeah. But not everybody's going to win. No, I mean, I mean, that's it's okay. So it's like you're, you're, you're judging styles. It's a subjective conversation, really, right? And it's not super ultra definitive. And at the end of the day, you know, the ultimate win winner is the culture. But for us on the inside, you know, when we have these conversations amongst ourselves, because it's from a different place, we know who won. Right. And I think that, you know, ultimately, I think, you know, what you're saying is that pushing yourself in that way is a really, really great thing, right? You benefit from pushing yourself. You benefit from trying to, to be as competitive. You might innovate something. You might do something that you normally might not have done, right? Yeah. You might add something to the game that wasn't there before. And so how else are you going to reach for that? without that sort of competition? I've only, yeah, I think I've gotten to the point that I am now. I don't know if I'm the greatest on the planet because, you know, I'd like to think I am, but I know I'm not. But I, I've, I think I've gotten to the point that I've gotten now because I, I've surrounded myself by guys that are really, really good. You know, it's like, they're so good to the point that it's effortless. Like, what takes me five hours takes them three. You know, not so much anymore. Now, you know, I, I think I'm pretty much caught up in the speed department and stuff like that. But, like, I've surrounded myself and have been exposed to people that are really good. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a pain. It's a pain. It's a pain. It's painful to have to paint next to BG-183. We did a battle on, in Hunts Point, and it's like, you know, that's painful. Here's how he yeah. – this is how light work it was for him. I stayed there and painted the whole time. He came, did his outline, painted a little bit. He left. <laughs> left for, like, a couple of hours, came back and smoked it. And I was just like, you know, that's not even funny. <laughs> well, you know, there's some there's some writers, you know, BG included, that have painted so much that he could probably do it with his eyes closed and it's, still it's, burn. It creatively and creatively, like they, they could do whatever they want to do. Yes. Right. There's no limitation. No. And so here you got 
a, a piece of with tea kid. And so you're painting with people that historically have been some of the best writers. You, you know, mentioned Nicer and BG and Bio and Tea kid and, and Serve. I mean, these are all people that, you know, are so, and Cess are some of the best in, in, in New York City. Yeah. Who, who, who's left for you to battle? Like, I mean, do you still do this or is it over? Well, I mean, I have, we haven't done no official battles in like forever. I mean, the last the last so-called battle, I was called out on some subliminal bullshit with some beef, but it was like, you know, that never happened. So, and we know why that didn't happen for us on the inside. But like, even the ticket thing, it wasn't necessarily a battle. It's always a battle, right? And I've said that a million times. I've been quoted as saying that. Bio said that in the interview when he said, you know how Sade always says it's always a battle. Because it is, right? It's like, you're always trying to do your best and not do... You know, if you're not battling, you're not going to do your best sometimes. You're just not. Because it's the it's that urge to win that will push you over the line sometimes and to take it a little bit further and, and try a little different of, of an effect. But with T-Kid, the experience with T-Kid, you know, it's, it's like T-Kid, when I, my first, like my first understanding of T-Kid was him getting up, right? Because he was out way before me. And I was looking at his stuff and I was like, ooh, ah, like everybody else was at that time. You know, and then I, I was on the, on the on the receiving end of TK when he went over a couple of my cars. So then we weren't seeing eye to eye. And then, you know, Mac kind of squashed that. And then, you know, like fast forward to all these years later, and then I got to paint with him, right? So it's kind of like, you know, this is TK you're painting with. Like, you can't come and paint next to him and do some whack shit because it's like, that's almost a disservice and it's almost disrespectful for you to do that. You know, if, if you're going to paint next to the dude, you better bring your A, B, and C game, and it better show that, that you really came like that. Because if not, then you don't got no business painting next to him. Go paint down the wall somewhere. That's right. That's right. And so, so, so say, we, we've just about hit the hour mark. And right. so Instagram cuts us off uh, after an hour. Okay. And so if you'd like to continue to talk, I mean, we have a full house here. Yeah, we with, can come back. We come back. So I'm going to, I'm going to log off, save this, and then I'll be back on in two minutes. So everybody out there, thank you so much for, uh, for being with us uh, and joining us tonight. Uh, it's been a great hour long conversation so far. We're going to keep it going uh, a little longer. And so bear with us. We're going to reset. Uh, join us. We'll see you in just a minute. Peace.